You want your people to have a big heart for God. Get them to know God and then get them to know His mission. And the prayer meetings will be transformed. How does God give us a bigger heart for Himself? That's the question that John Piper answers in this episode of Light and Truth. The sermon was originally preached in 1999 to a group of pastors in Kansas City, Missouri. From grade eight, how old are you in grade eight? 14? To sophomore in college, I could not speak in front of a group. My throat would freeze. My shoulders would become tense. My heart would beat 200 beats a minute. I could see it pushing my shirt like this. And I could not speak in front of any class. I was a a pretty good academic student. And so the likelihood that I could have, you know, been a vice president or a treasurer of of the freshman class or I couldn't give the speeches. You have to give a speech. I never became an officer of any class. I remember horrible moments. You laugh and you because you haven't been there. You only, you only think I'm talking about butterflies that all of you have and how hard it is for you to get up in front of a group, but you can do it. I couldn't. And I remember thinking, they want you to read a report of your science project in the ninth grade. I sit in the middle row halfway back. This day is emblazoned on my memory, as are many others. I have a half a page written about my balloon experiment. Static electricity makes balloons stand apart from each other. And I got a paragraph written, and I said, maybe instead of putting it in a piece of paper that would make noise and shake, I will put it on a firm spiral binder. And I sat there, and up, read, 30 seconds, sit, up, read, 30 seconds, up. And here it comes, down the line, toward me. And what happened inside of me was just horrible. I mean, I could hardly breathe my, my shirt was moving with my heart. My hands were shaking. My voice was totally closed off. And when the person in front of me got up to go speak, I got up and left the room, went to the bathroom, and just cried and cried and cried. That's ninth grade. And I went back and hoped they wouldn't, she wouldn't call on me. And I just said to her after class, couldn't do it. Civics, 10th grade. John, you have to give an oral book report. I can't give an oral book report. Well, if you don't give an oral book report, you can't get better than a C in this class. I'll take a C. I took a C. It's the only C I made in high school. That's the way it was. And my mother took me to a psychologist. Now, this is 1962. One. Nobody went to psychologists. (laughs) Especially Christians. And uh, this woman had me look at some... Rorschach charts, tell me what I saw. I didn't tell her what I saw. And uh, when she was done, she said, it's my mother's fault. (laughs) I was so mad, I stomped out and never went back. But I said, there's one person in this world who understands me. There's one person in this world who's getting me through. There's one person in this world who rubs my back at night when I'm crying and crying. There's one person who suggests that maybe at training union next Sunday, when I've got to give a one-minute thing, I would put it on a note card and lay it on a big, big wooden thing, and maybe that would help. And you're telling me she's the problem? I'll never see you again. Now, as I look back on those years, eighth grade to sophomore, and I won't go into the how, how God got the victory over this, although... I would simply say that if Gene Lawrence, the pastor of White Oak Baptist Church, were here today, he's dead, he's in heaven. And uh, if he saw this, he would say, like 
Paul or Luke wrote about Barnabas in Antioch, he saw the grace of God and was glad. Gene Lawrence would look at me standing here. His mouth would drop open. He would say, I have seen the grace of God. (laughs) And I am glad. Now, the point is this. When God clogged my mouth, he was filling my heart and making a preacher. When he broke me again and again and again and again and I and didn't answer my prayers, I thought, for all those years and made me desperate, I was finding him in dark places because there was no place else to turn. He cut me off of the fast track of popularity. I was simply an outsider in order that he might keep me close to himself and make me desperate for himself. I really do believe he was making a preacher in those days. Because to be on the fast track of popularity and to find it easy to speak doesn't make a person deep, doesn't make a person soft and warm and gentle and empathetic, doesn't make a person passionate and zealous. It just makes a person glib and popular. I view now, though I don't laugh and I don't minimize it, I go to creativity nights at my son's schools where you have to all do something oral in public, and I watch one tall, gangly fellow with pimples. I had the worst case of acne that anybody I knew because I was so nervous. My hormones were all over the place. And I watched this kid. This is what's happening now. And I can hardly sit through the torture they put that kid through. The same thing happens inside of me watching this kid try to read his four-line poem in Creativity Night at Calvin Christian School. And I just... Everything comes back to me. I'm just torn to pieces. Why do you put this kid through this? I wouldn't. I wouldn't force it if he didn't want to do it. So it's still very much with me. But what a difference. What a difference, frankly, I think, would be in my life if I hadn't spent certain cloudy Afternoon, sitting on my front lawn at the top of Bradley Boulevard, looking out over Delwood Forest towards Piney Mountain and listening to a train about 10 miles away and wondering what would happen if I would just get on that train and disappear where nobody asked why the preacher's kid can't talk. What a difference if I, if I hadn't spent any days sitting under a dogwood tree. I remember the dogwood tree in my front yard and I would sit under it trying to write a poem for my mother because she was the one person who understood. That was the making of a preacher. And I don't begrudge it anymore. I don't begrudge it. I thank God for it. And I just want to plead with you, preachers, when you walk between the wells, in the dry places, and your prayers seem like they're not getting answered, God's making a preacher. God is making a preacher, if you'll let him. If you'll submit to that, he's making a preacher. Don't begrudge it. Let me read you the biblical warrant for that outside this text. 2 Corinthians 1, 6. If we are afflicted, Paul says, it is for your comfort. You hear that, preacher? If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort when you patiently endure the same sufferings. Let me just point you to Martin Luther and what he said. Luther's so great on this issue. Luther Luther said there are three 
ways to become a preacher. He gave three Latin words. Oratio, meditatio, tentatio. Now, oratio, we all know. You got to pray. And pray, and pray, and pray, and pray. And you got to meditatio. You got to be in the Word and meditate and meditate. But not many people know tentatio. We run from tentatio. He translated in German, anfechtung. Which could be translated in various ways like attack or trial or temptation. And he meant suffering. He thanked the Pope for making his life miserable. And he based it on Psalm 119.71, which says, It was good for me that I was afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. That's why I use the phrase, the seminary of suffering. You're going to learn some great things here. You're not going to learn the main things here, probably. The main things are going to be taught to you in the dark nights when the key things here either become real or you become superficial. And all the exegesis, which is indispensable, and all the seeing of the careful connections between clauses using your original languages, which I also regard as incredibly valuable. I'll be careful not to use the word indispensable lest I ruin the day for everybody. But wonderfully fruitful in ministry. Don't know what I'd do without them. There will come a day... When all of that will explode between the wells with sustaining grace, or you will stay superficial. Last night, not everybody was here, of course, but I put it in the form of a poem. Sustaining grace is not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress, but this. The grace that orders our trouble and pain and then in the darkness is there to sustain. And you won't ever discover that except between the wells. So don't murmur and don't get angry. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Cry out with David, how long, O Lord? And say with him in Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. He heard my cry. He brought me up out of a desolate pit, out of the miry bog. He put my feet upon a rock. He made my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth. Many will see and put their trust in the Lord. That may take five years. There's nothing in that psalm that says how long you'll be in the mire. I have a man in my church who came to us from Arizona depressed. And he was depressed for eight years. Scarcely able to function. Would come to church and sit there like a zombie. And one day, being saturated in prayer all these years, being surrounded with the Word of God, with good biblical counseling, he came too, like a prodigal son. He stood in front of the bathroom door and woke up as though from a dream. And for the last seven years has been one of the most fruitful ministers of our church. I have no idea why the Lord would ordain for eight years of unanswered prayer. Or, better to say, eight years of delay until all the prayers gathered in a bottle were poured out in front of a bathroom when the time was full. Not one of your prayers is prayed in vain. We have a little saying at our church. Tom Steller, my associate for 18 years, loves to say it. When you pray, nothing never happens. God stores up your prayers in a bottle, and in time, He will pour them out. In ways, for me, it was 
It took me 25 years to understand what God was doing in my teenage years. So maybe you're, you're not in the place that you can yet understand what he was doing in the cancer, in the loss of the child. Back to the wells. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, You will say, in other words, preaching is born out of drinking, which sustains you through the wilderness. You will drink and you will say, and maybe in closing, I could just point to two, two kinds of saying. And I'll leave off a large part of this message just because I've brought in too many parentheses and we're going to be out of time. But the first thing you're going to preach is missions mobilization. Isn't that amazing? Have you noticed that? Did you notice this? Look. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, what do you say? What do you preach when you come up from drinking God at the bottom of this well? You will say in that day, here's what you say. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name Make known his deeds among the peoples. All right. Now think about this with me, pastors. I want to leave this with you, and maybe this is okay. This is ordained of God, but I can only get this far in my talk. Because this may be where he wants me to end. This may be his word to you. Say to your people, make known his deeds among the peoples. Notice, it isn't... When you come up from drinking, pastor, make known his deeds among the peoples. It's not what it says. It says, say, make known his deeds among the peoples. Meaning, preach missions mobilization. And here's the lesson I've learned for 20 years now about missions mobilization. If you want to excite your people about world evangelization, don't talk about world evangelization. Talk about the God of world evangelization. People are so tired about hearing about the cooperative program. And I only mention that because I could say the same thing in my denomination about our cooperative program, which I believe in. And I praise God for the cooperative program. There wouldn't be, what, 3,500, 4,000 missionaries on the field today without that amazing cooperative program? But I'll tell you, that doesn't turn anybody on, especially young people in the churches today. But tell them about God and the triumph of God in world evangelization. Tell them about unreached peoples where he means to have worship from those people. And then give a little footnote. You want to know how to get there? Be a, what do you call them, sojourners? No, that's not the word. Journeyman. Be a journeyman this summer. And then journeyman gets tacked in to God. And the vision of God to finish the Great Commission and see that he is worshipped and praised and exalted among the Dong Jang of northern China, where there isn't anybody right now. Get Patrick Johnstone's book, Operation World. You may have a Southern Baptist counterpart to that. I don't know. But be willing to reach outside your denomination and take some of these broader evangelical tools by which you can discover a people group for every day of the year and pray over them. And pastors, if you burn for this, they'll get it. And then you'll see missionaries over the years begin to rise up. You'll see people praying for missions. They'll stop praying for Aunt Mary's toenail at the, at the, at the prayer meeting. They'll stop saying, I've got three un, unspoken requests tonight. Sit down. What's this unspoken request? Just pray. Pray for the world. You want your people to have a big heart for God? Get them to know God and then get them to know His mission. And the prayer meetings will be transformed. So that people come and they'll start wrestling for people groups. They'll start wrestling against the powers of darkness over the Muslim world. No, you will feel like life has come. Life has come. So I get that, and I think it's legitimate to get it from this text. When you drink from the wells of salvation, you will say, Pastor, you will say, make known his deeds among the peoples. 
One last thing. What else will you say? You will become a missions mobilizing pastor and you will become a God exalting preacher. Now, I've said it already, but I'll close with it. It's in verse four. You will come up out of this well when you're drinking and you will say, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds upon the peoples, among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. In other words, you don't just get them to go. You give them the message. What are you supposed to proclaim when you go? And the answer is, say God is exalted. His name is exalted. We know his name. It's a name that's above every name. It has a human face. It's Jesus Christ who will one day be Lord of Lords and King of Kings when his whole kingdom comes on this earth. You tell your people, that's our message. Fill your mouth with the glories of Jesus. And you try to build. One of the reasons for preaching a God-centered gospel is that they will feel their hearts growing and exploding with a message worthy of about a billion Muslims. I mean, we can be overwhelmed with the thoughts of the Hindu world and the Muslim world. You can be absolutely overwhelmed with the unreached peoples unless the pastor has not been giving little psychological how-tos to get along but has been saying, our God reigns and he can do this. He can triumph over the Muslim world. He can bring peoples to himself from every people and tribe and tongue and nation. If you don't preach a great God, how can the people have confidence he's going to triumph over the nations and bring the peoples to himself? So my main how-to, and I'm sorry, I've got eight pages here I'm leaving out on on the how to drink from the wells. But I talked about in all, it's about prayer, it's about Bible reading, it's about fasting, it's about all the disciplines, and you're getting it straight from Don Whitney. He knows it better than I do. Take his classes, read your Bibles, pray like crazy. But mainly, find the wells every day. And when there's a space, if it's long, if it's short, Don't give up on the wells. Know that the wells are coming and you can bore it. And if you get so discouraged and so depressed that you feel unable to even dig and drink, wait patiently for the Lord. Wait patiently for the Lord. Call up from what He has given you in the past and taste the little bit that's left. Surround yourself with people to get their hands on you and pray for you and love you and ask God to lift the darkness from you. And I promise you, there is an edge to the wilderness. And there are wells in the middle, and they will open to you. And you will walk over the horizon someday, and there will be an oasis with many palm trees. And you will lie down and drink from your God, who is your salvation, and you will rise up and preach. And your people will be thankful for the wilderness wanderings you have patiently walked through. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper will preach on God Has Spoken, the first sermon in a new series titled, Listen to Jesus. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.